Hello everyone and welcome back to Coin Bureau. We are here at Token 2049 in Singapore and I have a special guest with me, Dan Tapiero, the founder and CEO of One Round Table Partners and 10T Holdings. Um, Dan, before we get going with the questions, can you just uh, can you just tell me a little bit about yourself and, and your work? Yeah, I know, absolutely. Uh, hi everybody, glad to be here. Um, yeah, we are uh, One Round Table Partners, 10T Holdings. We are growth equity uh, investor in the crypto blockchain Web3 space. We broadly call it digital asset ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, as far as I know, we are the only growth equity fund in the world that's exclusively focused on this space. And we've deployed $1.2 billion. Um, you know, the fund was launched in January of 21. We deployed 1.2 into 24 different businesses. Mm -hmm. We have board representation on, over, on 12 of the 24 companies that we own. And so we're deeply involved uh, in this ecosystem. The companies generally that we invest in have revenues over about $50 million. So it's a portfolio of more established companies in the space, not venture. We don't invest in the cryptocurrency or the tokens, um, but it gives my LPs a broad diversified exposure to the space, which we actually think is, is going to grow pretty dramatically in the next uh, 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. And what, so what attract, was there a particular, was there a particular moment for you where, where this, where this space suddenly made sense and that, and that drew you to it? Or has this been something that you've been, uh, has it been a slow build over many years? So I think it was, it was a bit of a slow build over mm -hmm. many years. Uh, I was in the macro hedge fund business for uh, 20 plus years and mm -hmm. was a portfolio manager in that world. And so I come from the traditional uh, investment world. And so I, I'm used to doing lots of diligence, um, lots of, I would say, investment research. And um, I tended to not invest in things that I didn't really understand. Mm -hmm. I could move into different areas, you know, whether it was commodities or emerging markets or bonds, and I could learn, but I needed to know and really understand the asset. So the problem here was that I have a physical gold business called GBI, Gold Bullion International. And um, today, that business is the third largest vaulter of gold in the world outside of the banking system. I started wow. that company in 08, 09 with a partner. He's still the CEO of, the, of that firm. That firm in 2014 integrated with a firm called BitReserve, which today is the Uphold Wallet. And we were the first place that you could buy or sell gold to buy or sell Bitcoin. Okay. So I came from that sort of traditional investment world, money match world, but then also I was, you know, pretty much. Uh, a gold investor as well and understood store of value. Mm. And we have this business GBI that's wonderful. Um, but it was in 14 that we integrated and we took a year integrating with uh, BitReserve and the Uphold Wallet. And, you know, we were making money from the transactions of mm -hmm. our clients, but I didn't really understand Bitcoin. Um, I didn't understand how it worked. I mean, people kept saying, oh, digital money. So, okay, that's great. I get that you know, store of value. Okay, I kind of get that, like in the digital sphere. But like, how does it work? And so people would say, oh, read the Satoshi white paper. It's eight pages. It explains, how, you know, sort of it's like a, I think an engineering paper. And it yeah. explains, you know, how the blockchains come together and what the incentive mechanism is, etc. And of course, it solves that very important problem that I had no idea about the Byzantine generals problem. I had no idea that that was even a thing. I didn't know anything about cryptography or computer science or anything. I was a portfolio manager. Mm. So I say slow. You said, did you come upon the space slowly or quickly? So I was introduced in 2014. I tried to read the Satoshi white paper, but failed. Okay. Let's say over a five-year period. Right. So I, I kept going back to it and it just... I would read like proof of work algorithm, okay? For a non, you know, I don't know, mathematician, uh, scientist, non-computer tech person, that was like hieroglyphics for me. Yeah. So, in fact, you know, frankly, stopped me like in, in, in dead in my tracks <laughs> every time I saw that proof of work algorithm. What is that? So anyway, in 2018, the market, as you know, we had the ICO boom and bust and the market collapsed. And so I had seen that a lot in the traditional markets where you'd had a huge bubble and then the market dropped 90 percent. So I'd seen that many times. And what normally happens is the asset either goes to zero 
or it's the buying opportunity. Mm -hmm. So at the end of 18, I was just managing my own money and I said to myself, okay, this is it. If I'm ever going to really understand Bitcoin, I'm going to lock myself in my, in my office, uh, in my home office in Greenwich, and I'm, I'm going to figure out what this Bitcoin really is. And so I spent six months, literally 10 hours a day, reading hundreds of articles, listening to lots of, you know, interviews and podcasts. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the intellectual environment or the, um, I would say, the, the number of uh, people who are chiming in, um, explaining things in the space in 2014 was limited. Very so limited. I, I want to I beat myself up for not going all in in 2014. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, you know, I, I don't think the educational intellectual infrastructure was there. You know, you had yeah. Antonopoulos, you had a few, you know, early people. But, you know, the Safadine Amos book was very helpful. Yeah. Um, you know, there were things, Jan Pritzker's book called Inventing Bitcoin was very helpful. And so, you know, I uh, didn't give up and I powered through and then I realized, oh my goodness, like I was a total, total idiot. I should have realized some of these things about Bitcoin earlier. I didn't. And the, the, the light bulb really was that um, uh, the Bitcoin, the, the eight pages, the Bitcoin network basically explains how you turn energy from our physical world into digital security. Yeah. And it explains the functioning and, you know, the method and functioning of the Bitcoin network, how that how that's gotten built. And I just thought, OK, now I, I get this. This, you know, paper solved an age old problem that had been unsolved, really, the Byzantine for hundreds of years or who knows how long of distributed trust. And the number of use cases were nearly infinite. And so I had this idea that essentially all things of value will eventually be on a blockchain and sit somewhere in this digital asset ecosystem. And I said, this is vast. It's not just um, the blockchainization of the existing financial world, mm -hmm. the markets I'd come from, but it's of all value. Anything of value will be on a blockchain. So I just thought, oh my goodness, this is the biggest macro trade of all time. And I have to be focused on this. And so I had uh, was not working at that. It stopped really uh, in 2012, mm -hmm. and I was just looking after my own affairs. And then I thought, "Wow, this is bigger than anything I've ever done." I invested in Bitcoin and Ethereum for myself, and um, in my own entity. And then I thought, "What else can I do in this space? Because am I going to just sit here for the next 10 years holding those uh, two assets? Mm -hmm. Maybe." But what I came up with was something that came out of my own experience, which was that I wanted to build a diversified portfolio of uh, investments, of bets in businesses that were a little more developed because the space is extremely volatile yeah. and very difficult to manage. And also, um, you know, it's mostly venture. It was mostly venture. And I was not a venture capitalist. I was not from Silicon Valley. I didn't understand technology that well. And so I thought there's no way I'm gonna compete against Andreessen and Polychain and Paradigm and Parafy and all of these very smart VCs in the space. Um, and I don't like that risk profile anyway. You make 10 investments, nine go to zero, and yeah. one maybe is Google and you're up a thousand X. I just wanted a bet on the sector. Right. And that was, so for a traditional macro guy, I built a sector bet and it's a portfolio you know, as I said, of 24 businesses now, 1.2 billion. And we really are in the middle of this ecosystem, this growth stage. Yeah. Um, so it was, you asked me the question, how did it happen? Well, it happened slowly and then all at once. <laughs> <laughs> and then I put down everything. I, I got rid of everything I had in the traditional world. I don't have really much uh, exposure in the old world anymore. Wow. Um, yeah, once you see the uh, upside potential and how big the TAM, the total addressable market of this space is, everything else is really dull. I mean, you know, bonds and uh, currencies, I mean, moving 10 or 20 percent, who cares? This is like a, this will be eventually uh, a restructuring of how human beings interact with the value. I mean, that's <laughs> That's pretty big. Yeah. That's pretty yeah. big. So, and that's also very exciting. 
Yeah. Uh, so well, it, that it, was my... It feels like we're still kind of at the start of that journey in a way, because I think a lot of people feel that, you know, when it comes to, when it comes to crypto or, or the digital asset space or, or however you look at it, that, you know, because we've had these crazy bull markets and these crazy price swings, that that ship has sailed and now it's, now it's time for something else. But people like yourself and many others in the industry recognize that this is actually just the start of what, you know, we've, we're only just beginning to unravel the potential of what, of what this space can, yeah. can achieve. Yeah, I mean, it, it really is uh, incredible and I, I, I agree. I mean, it, mm. it's hard to believe that like it's so early given, you know, when the white paper was written yeah. and, you know, Ethereum and founded in 2015. Um, but because you don't think eight years is just the beginning, but it really is. Yeah. And people look at you a little funny. Well, what do you mean just at the beginning? Um, you know, you have even this concept of tokenizing real world assets, RWAs, which has yeah. now become a little bit, uh, has been growing a little more in vogue in the last six months. Um, is still, we went from $100 million of uh, assets tokenized to now $800 million in a few months. But it's $800 million. Yeah. There are hundreds of trillions of dollars worth of assets. So, you know, and then you look at something like the stablecoin market, which literally three years ago was zero. Yeah. Okay? And last year, in 2022, you had $8 trillion of stablecoins settled. Eight trillion. Now, what in the traditional world goes from zero to eight trillion in three years, right? Yeah. And it's... I think that the thing that we all get caught up on a little bit, and certainly the traditional press, and I think doesn't really have an understanding of what's going on here, um, is that we say, oh, well, you know, Bitcoin is still down 50%, and Solana is down 90% from the high. Okay, Solana is down around 90% from the high. But in January of 21, which is not so long ago, two yeah. and a half years, Solana was $1. <laughs> it's 21. That's a 20x return in two and a half years. Yeah. Now, I don't know about you, but that's not so bad. No. Okay. Now, no. you had a 200x, and if you didn't take profit, well, that's, you know, that's, that's you know, A happens. lesson that needs to be learned. Yeah, yeah that happens. But um, the reality is, is that, the space is growing and morphing at a faster rate uh, today than at any time since I've been involved. Yeah. Um, the number of the innovations, the number of new ideas, new products, I'm not new use cases, um, the whole world of DeFi, again, two and a half years ago, did not exist. And yeah. so, yeah, TBL has dropped a lot from the peak, but it's still at, I think, $50 billion. Yeah. So, um, I think, look, it takes a lot of work to really understand what's going on in a sort of a, in a deep way, not just in a surface way. And a lot of people just don't have the time. If yeah. you're outside in the, this world and you have a traditional business, um, you can't set aside 10 hours a day for six months to really figure it out. Yeah. And you'll never guess who is in the car. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome back to GM Crypto. Now we have so much fun and exciting stuff coming up for you on today's show. But first, we need to talk about the Coin Bureau deals page, Guy. That's right, Jessica, because it really is the place to find the very best deals in crypto. For starters, you can find bonuses of up to $40,000 at some of the best crypto exchanges. And that's not all, Jessica, because you can also get discounts on hardware wallets, sign-up bonuses for some of the top exchanges, and trading fee discounts of up to 60%. Amazing, Guy! Where can people find this deals page? Well, just head on over to coinbureau.com forward slash deals or use the link in the description. I think that was one of the big uh, moments for a lot of people. That was uh, when COVID came along. And I yes. think so many people who are now, you, you know, who have been reaping the benefits ever since, they suddenly had all that time on their hands, didn't they? And for us, you know, for us as a channel, we saw an Im immense amount of growth at that time because all of a sudden people were like, I have this time. I can I can do this. I can lock myself away right. in my home office and read the Bitcoin white paper and right. Safety Dean's book and yeah. At, absolutely. And I, I did the same. Mm. I did the same. Um, I you know, I think it's a, a curse and a blessing in the sense that 
it's a blessing because there's a significant moat around the space. Yeah. It's very hard um, to get to a place where you have confidence that you're making the right investment. Um, but it's a curse in a sense also because um, you have so many very smart people from the old world who continue to be naysayers. And I think some of that is just changing now. The Larry Fink turn for, I would say, institutional investors was very important. Do not underestimate that. Two years ago, he was very clear. He said, Bitcoin is a fraud. It's yeah. for money laundering or whatever it was. And we're thinking, oh my gosh, how could he say that? Two years later, he says, Bitcoin is a global asset and he wants the ETF. Yeah. So <laughs> I would not underestimate the importance of the, that switch and those comments to, let's just say, you know, U.S. institutional capital, but also, I think, global capital. Yeah. He's, you know, it's a 10 trillion asset manager, very well respected. Um, and it seems like every few months we get another turn like that. Some guy who was a naysayer turns somehow. Yeah. And so um, I, I, I think... You know, as I said, slowly and then all at once. Yeah. I think that's how people um, come to it. Yeah. Yeah. Have you, do you, have you noticed sort of since that Larry, since Larry Fink sort of pulled that 180, have some of your friends from the traditional finance space from your days back then, have they been sort of, you know, more interested getting in touch with you and, and asking more about it? Or um, I think, you know, I think it's incrementally yes. Mm -hmm. um, there isn't a sort of uh, like a, a knee jerk uh, reaction. We're getting, you know, data points. I think the, the key point is that over time, you know, versus, you know, three years ago, the space to me feels night and day. Yeah. Yeah. It's still the first inning, but even five years ago, it was really just about the Bitcoin price going up and down. And then Ethereum became more important. But if you remember, even you know, three, four years ago, you had all these people saying, oh, Ethereum's a fraud, they, they control the supply, they're gonna flood the market. I mean, actually, in fact, Ethereum is getting burned more quickly than, I mean, the supply is tightening more quickly it's, than it's even Bitcoin. It's deflationary at times, yeah, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, I, the Ethereum ecosystem has also exploded. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not just NFTs and DeFi, but um, I just, the way that they've managed also the transition from, uh, proof of work to proof of stake, I think was brilliant. It doesn't really get as much uh, kudos, I would say. It was a great achievement, but wasn't it? I think so. I mean, again, I, you know, sometimes you're sitting there and you're thinking, wow, this is just incredible. And no one else is saying anything <laughs> yeah. about it. So am I wrong? Am I right? I don't know. Um, yeah. But all of a sudden, um, you have many traditional companies, uh, and we see this in the press, um, you know, looking to incorporate, let's say, blockchain into their business models. You have, mm -hmm. you know, Starbucks partnership with Polygon, right? I mean, that's just crazy. Just three, four years ago, Starbucks and Polygon, I mean... Not you two be, names you'd put together, uh, no, yeah. No, no, you wouldn't, you know? And um, I, I just, uh, you know, PayPal's movement into the space. I mean, yeah. traditional companies, and it's not just payments companies. Uh, you have the luxury goods companies, you know, that are trying to figure out how to get closer to their community via NFTs and how to track the, um, the provenance of their, uh, of their items, of their goods, yeah, yeah. their goods. And so this distributed ledger, people are beginning to see, oh, I can use it for this and I can use it for that. And it, you know, it just, people are so caught up in the moment or in, you know, by the fact that, oh yeah, the Bitcoin price was 60,000, it's now 30. Okay, but if I look back three, four years, I mean, really night and day. Look, yeah. When I first had the idea for the fund, it was the middle of 2019, and the total value in the space then was 300 billion. That's the value of all the cryptocurrency in the world and the value of all the equity. It's an internal measure that we, we use, so it's 300 yeah. billion. In, uh, at the peak 18 months ago, it had gone to 3.2 trillion. Yeah. And today, we're 1.7 trillion. So there's 1.7 trillion dollars of value in our world, which is unbelievable. Yeah. Okay, it's down half from the peak, but 
it's up 5x from yeah. four years ago. And so I just think that people don't realize that adoption, as we always talked about it, institutional or retail adoption, is happening at pretty much a breakneck speed. Something goes up 5x in four years, it's like 100% a year. Yeah. Like, yeah. that's pretty fast. <laughs> and so I have this sort of big picture, you know, macro perspective, and that's my background. Um, so I frankly, I, I have never been more bullish on the space. And the opportunities that exist now, uh, from a pricing perspective, are very good. Mm. Um, you had, you know, the, uh, the FTX fraud, um, I think, um, forced some people uh, to pull back from the space. Yeah. Well, I, I wanted to ask you about mm -hmm. that because it's soon going to have been a year uh, since FTX collapsed back mm. in November 22. So just can you cast your mind back? Do you, do, you feel, do you feel sort of more optimistic now than perhaps you did this time last year since before yeah. FTX? Because obviously FTX... Well, sucked so much morale out of the space, a lot of people left and didn't yeah. come back. Yeah. Do, you, do you think we've got past that? Or? Yeah, I, I was very clear about this. In fact, at London Token 2049, mm -hmm. uh, the event was the day after the FTX um, oh, wow. uh, fraud. And I was up there on the panel and they said to me, so um, Dan, how you know, is, is FTX going to impact uh, you know what you're doing and I said you know what to be honest uh, maybe the maximum loss is 10 billion dollars it's a fraud a garden variety fraud I said this and I said I don't think the FTX impact is going to be that large on our portfolio the next day I'm quoted by one of the the news sources Dan uh, Tapiero doesn't think the FTX fraud is going to have much impact they left off on my portfolio so they had sort of <laughs> Yeah, I, I, of course it, it's had impact, but it's been impact in the sentiment um, and it's done a lot to, I think, push the people who were, you know, Johnny come lately or tourists into the space. Yeah. I, in fact, um, think that the low in price happened right on that FTX announcement and the Ethereum price um, couldn't make a new low on the announcement of that fraud. So an uh, old time trader, that's called a bullish divergence. And so when uh, you have the worst piece of news that you can imagine mm -hmm. and the market can't make a new low in price, it tells you that all the selling has dried up. Right. And so I then deployed the remaining portion of my third fund. It was $120 million into eight different businesses within six weeks wow. or so of that, um, of that low. And I was buying stock in the secondary market at, at you know, 40 to 80% discounts from previous rounds. And those discounts still exist in the secondary. And then you've also had some very, you know, traditional private equity people who had come into the space, you know, and Tiger and Toma Bravo and then Tomasic, the Canadian pensions. They came into the space, they pushed valuations up unreasonably, mm -hmm. and now they've moved back out. Yeah. And so we are in a fantastic position right now. It's in fact why I'm raising my fourth fund right now, because, um, the opportunity set from a price perspective has never been better. And I like buying low prices, you know, I, you know, and, and many of the companies that we're looking at, they're doing well. I mean, Circle as an example, which we own, uh, will do 800 million in revenue this year and did 800 million last year. Yeah. Um, you know, Anamoka is another company we doing very well. Um, the options exchange, uh, the Deribit is, is doing very well. So, we have companies in the portfolio that despite the drop in the price of Bitcoin and ETH from the peak are making good money and in some cases even better money than last year. Yeah. And so, um, but again, it, it takes a lot of work to realize what's going on underneath the hood. Yeah. 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 And that, that is, that's the thing that so many people look to, you know, the price. Of the price of Bitcoin and everything else, you realize that that's such a, 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 a very superficial way of looking at it. You know, yeah, it's, it's, the, one it's thing. beneath the surface. It's just, you know, it's what everyone looks at first, but it pays to look beyond. And I mean, I think, I think something like this event that we're at at the moment is a good example because I came out of this. I've been uh, back in Dubai for the last few weeks. 
uh, in the studio making videos and sort of following the, the news in the crypto space. And sentiment has been very low, you know, market sentiment. In Dubai? In, um, or you mean generally in the in, markets? In general yeah. in the markets. Okay. And yet you come here and there's so much positivity. There's clearly so much being built. There's some, uh, from what I've seen, some wonderful projects, yeah. you know, uh, under construction. And so I was going to ask you what I was going to ask you what you had taken what you've taken away from from this oh, conference so yeah. far, and also what you think because obviously we talk about the U.S. market a lot, mm. um, and the things like the ETFs that we that we yeah. touched on earlier, they're all they you know that's all U.S. based. So much focus is on the U.S. What what's your take on what you've seen here at Token Twenty Forty Nine, and what's your yeah. take on on the Asian market in general for yeah. crypto? Well, this is as you has been very eye opening. I mean the enthusiasm, the energy here, uh, it does not feel like a bear market. I mean, no. I think the bear market finished. The bull phase hasn't really begun yet, but we're in this consolidation period, but it feels uh, very different. I mean, I'm almost getting run over walking around outside. <laughs> uh, I, you know, like you, it's hard to move around without people wanting to come up and talk to you. Um, and I think it's very robust, uh, especially Singapore, Hong Kong, where I think you know, they've, you know, I don't want to say laid out the welcome mat, but mm. there's a framework here for crypto businesses and for, um, you know, early stage, mid stage companies to come and set up here. In the US, regulatory framework is not as clear right now. And I think that we're, we're at a speed bump uh, there. The reason the interest is there is because, you know, the US is hundreds of trillions in assets, uh, by far the, the wealthiest country in the world. Um, and the U.S. has been the leader in technological and financial innovation over the last 50 years. And so I think really the surprising thing is that the U.S. is not leading the charge here. It's being led by these different groups in different areas. This is a decentralized world. You have um, the U.K. actually has come out and laid out a, a pretty, uh, you know, a more clear regulatory framework. And I think we're going to see more on that in the next six months. I said Singapore, Hong Kong, and then Dubai, Abu Dhabi, yeah. um, also doing quite a lot to encourage um, uh, companies to set up there. And um, I think they're just thinking to themselves, how is it that we're allowed to, how are we able to pull these companies from the US? Yeah. And I think it's temporary. I mean, the US will come around at some point, but also remember this, 80% um, of total world cryptocurrency trading volume is done outside the US. Yeah. So this is truly a global uh, business, a global industry, um, more global than anything I've ever, uh, I've ever seen. You have people in each country around the world, up and down the socioeconomic strata that actually own cryptocurrency and they have digital wallets. And um, the traditional financial markets, you have really only like 20 currencies that actually trade. Yeah. If you're a portfolio manager, there are only 20 countries that have liquid enough real currencies. I mean, 20, right? That's, that's what are all the other countries doing? Yeah. Uh, you know, if you want to, I, I, I don't know, especially the emerging markets. And I think that's something that we in the West and in the U.S. really don't focus on at all, which is that for many countries around the world, um, and again, the ledger, blockchain, many use cases, but in terms of uh, Bitcoin and ETH and the currencies, that those are the only two that for me would be, I think, store of value. Those are core assets to the yeah. ecosystem. The other cryptocurrencies are more venture projects to me that are still not proven. They don't have network effect. But the point is, is that in the emerging world, these cryptocurrencies are lifesavers. Yeah. You know, the Argentinian uh, uh, peso deval, um, you know, the Venezuelan collapse, uh, the collapse in Turkish lira. These, these countries uh, where a fiscal and monetary policy is kind of out of control or doesn't even really exist in a proper sense, you can convert your lira to Bitcoin and my God, you've just, it's a savings technology. Yeah. You've, you've saved your, your family's <laughs> savings. I mean, it's yeah. phenomenal. And, you know, we in America, you know, we have the dollar, so we don't really worry about anything. Um, but I think uh, it's hard if you're thinking of, from a global perspective not to see how important this is. Yeah. And so, yeah, so obviously, as you're saying, like so much of we see so much of crypto's use taking place in emerging markets in places like well, in places like Turkey or places like Egypt, Argentina, etc. 
And I think that gets forgotten about because so much of the investment comes from the United yeah. States. And yet crypto is, is way more global than that. Yeah, I mean, look, it's a, it's a great point. Um, but we're talking really here just about uh, in the emerging world of you know, Bitcoin maybe being used for payments or really as a savings uh, technology. Uh, what's interesting now is that, um, and I don't think Satoshi or any of the early Bitcoiners would have ever thought that the technology that's behind Bitcoin would be adapted in so mm. many different ways with so many different use cases. And so that's really, you know, in the beginning, the first seven, eight years, people really fought against Bitcoin because they said, well, it's not going to supplant the dollar and this currency doesn't belong. It can't be controlled by anybody. You have all these people even today that think that, you know, you know someone has to manage and control it. A decentralized currency uh, is, you know, is, 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 is worrisome, mm -hmm. right? And so we move sort of beyond that. That's one use case that has been very, I think, as I said before, a lifesaver for emerging market um, families looking to protect against poor monetary and fiscal policy, um, but it's taking on a whole other, um, uh, I, I think, a whole, uh, a whole other facet is being uh, mined right now. And um, my big, big picture view, again, and I think I said it earlier, is that at some point in the future, all things of value will sit on a blockchain and be in the digital asset ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And so that is something, uh, a vision that's beyond just Bitcoin for payments, which is for six, seven, eight years. That's what people were focused on. I don't think anyone would have imagined how big and how fast uh, things have grown. Yeah. 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 And of course, you know, we were talking about we were talking about the sort of total market cap earlier. You know, a little over a, a trillion, and yet you look 1. at 1.7, 1. 1.7 yeah. trillion. Yeah, and you look at uh, but you look at other asset classes like gold, for instance, and that's that's in the tens of trillions, right? I mean, we've yeah. still got we've still got a, a very long way to go. Like yeah. you're saying, like we we've come a long way, and there's still a very long way still to go. I know you're a very busy man, Dan. So just before you go, I just wanted right. to ask, like you talked. Um, you were talking earlier about the, the time after FTX when market mm -hmm. sentiment was, was really, really low. Uh, do you feel, are you, sort, are you now looking to you know, invest sort of beyond the likes of, of Bitcoin and Ethereum? Do you, think this is, do you think this is a good time for people to be, to be getting back so, into the market or is it, is yeah. it still a time oh, yeah, for caution? No, this is, this is a, a great time, but I, in, in my world, um, and again, the fund, we only invest in the equity of the more mature businesses. Mm. But as an investor, and what I would advise people is to understand that Bitcoin and Ethereum are established assets. They've achieved network effect. Um, they are the core assets of the space. For me, I'm not so much a venture investor. Some of the other protocols, I would call them their more venture projects. Mm -hmm. And so this is an extremely difficult market to trade. Um, I would suggest, you know, if people want to make an investment that they, you know, allocate a certain portion of their income every month or every quarter or however it is into Bitcoin and Ethereum. And I think these prices are great. Whatever, I think if you're buying now, I think five years from now, you'll be very happy. Um, but they should understand I, the other cryptocurrencies at this stage are still trying to prove themselves. Yeah. Um, you know, you have some that have, you know, have lasted eight, seven, eight, nine years. Um, but to me, they just feel different than those two. Um, and so I would suggest if you want to be involved in the future and uh, uh, have some exposure, um, I would just, you know, the dollar cost average slowly over time into those two. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Dan, it's been so good. It's so interesting to get, uh, you know, a, an institutional point of view on all this. And as you say, the market has come so far. There's still so much ahead of us. It's a really exciting time. And it's great to talk to you and get such an, an, an upbeat view on it. And so I really appreciate you taking the time. And, yeah, my um, pleasure. Happy uh, to be here. Yeah, we well, must I'll do this again. I'll see you in Dubai uh, yeah. soon, right? Absolutely. Good. Absolutely. Thank you for watching, everyone. Uh, we, will, we can leave some uh, links below to places that you can follow Dan and his work, and we will be back again soon. Thank you.